Okay, uh, I've been sharing with you for the last several weeks a, uh, a series of, of messages based on six steps to success in life, and this is step number six today. Um, step number one was our self-image, our sense of efficacy, or how we see ourselves, and the essential for seeing ourselves the way that God sees us, and uh, not, not to see ourselves as, as caterpillars, but to see ourselves as metamorphosized into butterflies, our sense of efficacy. The second step to success is positive relationships, and we recognize God's Word tells us to love our neighbor as ourself, amen? And uh, it also tells us in Scripture that for a man to have friends, he must show himself friendly. And so how important it is for us to develop relationships with others, and that will benefit us. In fact, what you're going to find out, it's, it's not how much it, you get in life, it's how much you give in life. And when you're willing to focus on how much you can give in life, you receive. But if you just focus on how much you get in life, you'll be sadly disappointed. Okay, Giving is, is really what opens the door for success in your life. And so giving in relationships. The third is goals and the importance of, of having a target to shoot at and something that you're working toward, legitimate goals. You have them. Uh, all of us have goals in our lives to some degree or you wouldn't have made it to church on time today. Um, we have goals that we, that we work toward. But having those specific goals, particularly those large ones in our life that we are taking daily steps toward, um, it's not necessarily accomplishing the goal um, that is the most significant part of our success. The significant part of our success is taking steps for, forward toward the accomplishment of that particular goal. I'm, I was just sharing this morning, I use the, use the terminology when people ask me how I'm, do, how I'm doing, I say I'm, I'm living the dream. But I'm adding to that, and I'm just going to say when this dream is fulfilled, I'm going to dream another one. You know, And when this goal is met, then you need to set more goals. And this needs to be a process in your life, a process of growth, a process of development, a process of becoming more. Amen? How many of you know that God wants you to be more tomorrow than what you are today? He wants you to progress. He wants you to develop. Um, and then um, number four, the fourth step was attitude. And uh, more than... We, we've. We've shared with you that more than your aptitude, it's your attitude that determines your altitude. Okay, more than your aptitude, it's your attitude that determines your altitude. And your, your attitude basically is how you deal with life situations. You know, we can't change what comes our way, but we can change our response to them. Amen. And if you're waiting for life to change, you're going you're gonna to be frustrated and disappointed. Because life is always going to be filled with those things that will bring us disappointments and discouragements. But if we work internally on our attitude toward those issues, we are taking a step, a positive step towards success. Number five, last week we dealt with work. And there's a whole lot of people, they, they want as much as they can get for as little as they can invest. You know, they want the benefits without doing the putting forth the effort. It's a whole lot easier to get the million dollars by buying a lottery ticket that gives you a million dollars than it is to put forth the work and the labor to achieve a million dollars in life. And there's a whole lot of people just figuratively speaking buying lottery tickets trying to get as much as they can get for as little as they can give. And work is a necessary process of our lives. Amen? In fact, Scripture tells us that if we don't work, we shouldn't even eat as Paul admonished the church in Thessalonians. And he also admonished the church at Colossae. He told them, he said, whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. Amen? We shared last week, and I just want to reiterate this, is, is that all of us got 24 hours in a day. All of us do. Nobody gets any more, nobody gets any less. I don't have a 25-hour day, and Kevin here doesn't have a 23. We all get 24 hours. The majority of that time, for a lot of us, is spent in work or in work preparation, okay? Those of us that are on the workforce, we probably, if you're working full-time, you pretty much work eight hours a day plus. That doesn't include transportation to and from. That doesn't in include getting ready, 
getting ready for work and the various things that you need to do. So it, it, takes, it takes a big part of our lives, of, of our waking hours are spent in work. Would, you, would everybody agree with that? Everybody sees that. Another big portion of our lives is spent in sleep. And uh, if, if, I don't know, they say eight hours of sleep. I, I, it's been a long time, I think, since I've consistently gotten eight hours of sleep a night. But a, a lot of people get eight hours of sleep. And eight hours of sleep is a large portion of that 24-hour day. It's a one-third portion of that day. So uh, you have most likely less than one-third left that's not spent on working and sleeping. And some of that is spent on eating and, and uh, uh, cleaning and the various projects you have to do with your life. But I just bring this to your attention to say that if work is something you hate, if work is something that you despise, if work is something that frustrates you, then you live a frustrated life. You do. Because there is a large portion of your life that's spent doing that. And if it frustrates you, then you are a frustrated person. Right? Okay? The key is you can't change work. And there's, there's a, you can get maybe a better job or you can, you can try for employment somewhere else. But there's always going to be challenges. And there's always going to be those days you don't feel like answering the alarm clock. There's going to be those days that, you know, you, you, I can't wait till it's Friday type days or, or whatever they say. Thank God it's Friday. Those kind of frustrations that we have. It's time for us to declare, man, I, I'm looking forward to Monday. <laughs> because my attitude is different. My attitude is not necessarily how, how, how much this is, is something I despise, but what an opportunity it is for me. Amen? So if we can deal with work in a positive way, we can, we can develop success in our lives. I want you to be successful. I want you to have a positive self-image of yourself. I want you to have positive relationships. I want you to have goals that you're striving for so that, so that you are accomplishing things that are significant in your life. And I, I just read recently that more important than security in your life for, for bringing you that joy and fulfillment in your life, more important is security than security is significance. And there's a whole lot of people that are stuck in security mindsets and their lives are very insignificant. Are you with me on this? Okay. Maybe you're not, but if you are, uh, I want to just encourage you along those lines. And then uh, your attitude, your attitude again, more important than your aptitude, your attitude's going to determine your altitude. And then work. And then the last thing that we're going to mention today, and uh, hopefully it, it, I, I, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to spend two hours telling you about this, but the last step is desire. Desire. Desire sets the fire. Desire sets the fire. Um, you know, the best people that work for me are the people who want to work for me. You know, the best people that could be successful on the team that I coach, if I'm coaching a team, are the people that want to play for that team. And they want success. They have a desire, a strong desire to achieve, a strong desire for success in their lives. And so for you to reach the top and for you to, and if you to take that next stop, step in your life is to identify your desires and to build on those desires in your life. Um, a definition of a desire that we're going to use today is a goal with an emotional attachment. It's a goal with an emotional attachment. It is something that you want so bad. It's, it's a goal that's before you, but there's an emotional attachment that you have to that goal that is building up these fires in your life, these fires in your life. And we've seen that desire, how desire has set the fire. We've, we've seen this in our land, and we've, we've heard the reports of individuals that have done dramatic things all based on desires. You've heard of the, the, uh, the mother that, whose child was underneath the automobile. How many of you have you've read those type of things where a child was underneath an auto, automobile and just the desire to set her child free but over, overrun any kind of, of uh, reali reality uh, disclaimers that this could not be done. She grabbed the car and lifted it up. And they were and, and was able to free her child from underneath a car. There's no way physically she could have done that. In fact, her desire 
to see her child free from that condition, over, over, overruled even her physical limitations. So your desire can do so much more than you realize. So much more than you realize. I've heard that a, uh, uh, I, I guess it was a, a Jersey cow, a Jersey cow heard that they, they tried to separate a, Jer- a calf from a Jersey cow. And uh, it was outside the barn. And uh, that Jersey cow heard that calf crying and tore down the side of the barn. Tore down the whole side of the barn to get out to her calf. Um, you've seen, I, I'll tell you, I've, I've raised dogs. I've raised dogs. And uh, I've had male dogs and female dogs. But I'll tell you this, with my male dogs... When there's a female in heat near one of my male dogs, that dog can do amazing things. (laughs) It can jump high. It can run fast. It can do things that it normally doesn't do. All controlled by a desire within within that animal. How many of you know that? I I mean, you know that maybe, maybe you haven't raised dogs, but you've seen those kinds of things, that desire sets the fire. There is power in desire. There is power in desire. You know, um, Napoleon Hill said this, and I read his quote. It says, A burning desire to be and to do is the starting point from which the dreamer must take off. Dreams are not born of indifference, laziness, or lack of ambition. Okay? Okay. A burning desire, I really like this, I'm going to read it again to you, Napoleon Hill. A burning desire is to be and to, a burning desire to be and to do is the starting point from which the dreamer must take off. It's the launch pad, okay? You do not elevate, you do not see dreams accomplished, I'm adding that. The quote goes on to say, dreams are not born of indifference, laziness, or lack of ambition. And we all realize that, right? Is that you're not going to see your dreams fulfilled by just being indifferent toward them. You're not going to see your dreams fulfilled by just lazily not doing anything. And you're not going to see your dreams fulfilled by having no ambition to work toward the fulfillment of that. But a desire, a burning desire, is the launch pad to seeing those things accomplished in and through your life. Amen? Amen? Those of you, I'll tell you this, and I I bring this down because this is so essential. The prime directive, and I I don't think that there's anyone that would debate me on this, the prime directive of humanity, the prime directive of humanity is to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second commandment is linked to it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And God goes on through Jesus to tell us, and upon these two laws hang all the law and the prophets. So the prime directive in our life is based on our desire for God and our desire toward our fellow man. Would you, would you agree with that? Our desires, our love toward them are the are essentials in our lives for us being the men and women that God wants us to be. Desire is so essential and it needs to be built up and it needs to be encouraged. A uh, military general, I don't know who he was, but a military general who was in a battle went, uh, landed on a particular shore, shoreline, and at the time that he landed there, he was going forward, the enemy was before him, he commanded, he commanded his troops to burn all his ships. How many of you have heard that? He commanded, all, he commanded his troops to burn all his ships. What did he recognize? He recognized that there is power in desire. And if there was always the option of retreat, they're not going to fight with the intensity that desire would give them for success. Okay? So he emptied himself of the option of retreat and basically put his troops into a position it's either be successful or die. When that is before you, be successful or die, how many of you recognize that there is going to be a strong desire to be successful? You either be victorious in this battle or else. That's it. And so he recognized the importance of that. And I'm not, I'm not encouraging all of our uh, 
our military personnel to burn all their ships, no, no doubt about that. But at this particular time, it's just the emphasis of this is, is that your desires have a way of pushing you toward purpose. Listen to that again. Your desires have a way of pushing you toward purpose. Amen? Okay. Um, there was a man, I want to read you this, I thought this was interesting. His name was Edwin Barnes. Um, and I, I, this is just a, just a, a, a little uh, about Mr. Barnes. It says, it goes without saying that we all desire to have something new in our lives, but how many people really have the obsession to focus and work towards that, what they want to really make it happen? It was in early 1900s when one Edwin Barnes from the Midwest had a burning desire to be a partner with Thomas Edison. He was one of the greatest inventors of all time. And although Barnes planned to work with the great inventor side by side, he faced a couple of challenges, which, made, which almost made his, dr the, his dream of being Thomas Edison's business associate seem like chasing the wind. Three of the major challenges that Barnes faced were included. Number one, he had never met or had any association with Thomas Edison. Number two, poverty had been his best ally since he was born. And number three, he had no idea what he could offer Thomas Edison to make him become his partner. So in other, he had this desire, but he had these challenges to his desire. And it says, although Edwin Bar Barnes had a couple of shortcomings, he still persisted and knew in his mind that he would one day become Thomas Edison's business partner, and he backed that with a courage and will to succeed. Barnes traveled by a freight train to Orange, New Jersey in 1905. And the reason he took a freight train is because he couldn't afford a passenger train. And when Edwin Barnes arrived in Orange, New Jersey, he presented himself to Thomas Edison while he was in his laboratory and declared he'd come to work with the great inventor. Thomas Edison, sensing Barnes' determination to succeed, offered him the opportunity to work in his offices as a floor sweeper and for a nominal wage. And this was an offer to which Barnes gladly accepted even though it wasn't related with Thomas Edison's main line of work, for he knew that temporarily working for the great inventor would give him the opportunity to learn from him, meet his associates, and generally know how Thomas Edison had built his vast empire. Months went by, but still Edwin Barnes didn't get his partnership with Thomas Edison. Though he decided to use his opportunity of working in Edison's offices as a floor sweeper, to showcase his expertise in order to capture his partners, future partners, hopefully, attention, which right now eluded him. So basically what happened is here's a poor guy. He, he sees this m major inventor, Thomas Edison, and he just has a desire to be his partner. He just has this desire in his heart to be his partner. The problem is, is that he's not an inventor. He doesn't have any inventions to his name. He's lived in poverty, and he's never even met Edison. He doesn't know him. He shows up on the scene, miraculously afforded an opportunity to talk with Thomas Edison, and Thomas, says, Thomas Edison basically says, you're not going to be my, you can't be my partner, but I'll, I'll tell you what, you can be, I need a janitor. You know, you can sweep my floors. And so that's where this started. It says, Edwin, Edwin Barnes continued working for Thomas Edison for about two years. And after two years, a break came in the form of a marketing obstacle. Edison had just finished working on his newest invention, which was called the Edison Dictating Machine. Um, it's currently called, at the time of this writing, an Edaphone. Uh, I imagine most of you don't know what that is. And feeling optimistic about it, he was ready to commercialize it through his salesmen. And they weren't optimistic, for they claimed it would... Uh, it would need a lot of effort to, they would need a lot of effort to even sell one of these dictating machines that Thomas Edison had invented. And the tug of war between Edison and his salesman went on for a while until Edmund Barnes, the floor sweeper, saw a very rare opportunity to seal his partnership with Thomas Edison for once and for all by offering to sell the Edison dictating machine on his behalf, a task which Thomas Edison's sales force had deemed to be next to impossible. 
Armed with great determination and a solid marketing plan, Barnes approached Edison and offered his marketing services to the great inventor, since in his eyes he deemed the machine would be a great help to thousands of executives, as it would uh, save them time and increase profits. Upon seeing Edwin Barnes's determination to sell his latest invention, Thomas Edison gave him permission to sell the dictating machine, and within a few months, Barnes had sold thousands of the Edison dictating machine. Edison dictating machine, circa 1917, um, and it be, he be, Thomas Edison became so impressed with Ed, Edwin Barnes as he, he gave him a contract to sell his dictating machines across the nation. And uh, Barnes had a fi- finally achieved his dream. He was actually, you could call him, he was a business partner of Thomas Edison. As the results of his efforts and disciplines, Barnes became a multimillionaire at a relatively young age, and because of his success at selling Edison dictating machines, a business slogan made by Edison and installed by Barnes was born. After a couple of years, Thomas Edison was asked about his first encounter with Edwin Barnes, and he replied by saying, he stood there before me looking like an ordinary tramp, but there was something in the expression of his face which conveyed the impression that he was determined to get what he had come after. I had learned from the years of experience that with men, years of experience with men, that when a man really has a desire of a thing so deeply that he's willing to stake his entire future on on it, um, he is sure to win. I gave him the opportunity he asked for because I saw he made up his mind to stand by until he succeeded. His subsequent events prove that no mistake was made. I, I, I read that uh, not too long ago, and I was just impressed, because here, here, here's an individual. What was the fire? What lit the fire under him? It was the fire of desire. The fire of desire. And he had a desire that, he was, will, that was overriding obstacles that he faced. We have to have, if we want to be successful, and how important this is for us as Christians... We need to have a desire to be righteous. We have, a, we have to have a desire to be the men and the women that God has created us to be. Otherwise, we're going to be overcome by the obstacles that Satan is continually throwing before us. Amen? It is the strong desire that keeps the fire burning and keeps us going forward to accomplish the task. I want to, uh, I want to share with you... Uh, uh, a brief acronym here, if I may. I'm going to take the word desire, D-E-S-I-R-E. And I'm going to break it down to you as far as dealing with your desires. We all have desires, but this is how not only you can identify them, but how you can bring them under, under control and under submission to the Lord to utilize them as a fire in your life. The first is determine what your desires are. Determination, D, determination. Um, I want a new car. I want a new motorcycle. I want to do that. I want a new job. I want this. Well, those, those are just superficial. What, what, what truly is your desire? What do you want that new car to bring into your life? What is it that, that motorcycle, what do you truly desire that motorcycle to bring into your life? You want a new job. You want to make more money. Why? What is the true desire? And so taking time to examine yourself. Okay, so D is determination. Determine exactly what your desires are. And determination not only goes on identifying or determining what your desires are, but it's also based on a determination to accomplish those desires. Here's a a little uh, statement that you can utilize. I will until. Everybody say that. I will until. I will until. If you have desires... That's going to be your position. I will until. I, how many of you have a desire to be like Christ? I will until. My desire to be like Christ is going to keep me going in that direction until I get there. Amen? I will until. So a determination, a determination 
that keeps you going in that direction. So not only are you identifying or, or determining what your desire is, but you have a determination to continually progress toward them. E is evaluation, is evaluation. And what we need to do with our desires, and I was just dealing with this, this, this acronym just, just yesterday in my life or, or Friday, praying these things and, and bringing them before the Lord and bringing this to my, I need to evaluate my desires. Are they legitimate? Are they legitimate? Do they, are, they, are they contrary to my values? Do they contradict, do they contradict my current realities? For example, my, one of my desires when I was young, my dad is a graduate of uh, Penn State uh, uh, University, but back in the, um, it would have been back in the early 50s. But the, uh, my, my goal as a child was to play quarterback for Penn State, okay? That desire has since ceased, and if that desire was still here, I would recognize that's really probably not appropriate for me at this particular time in my life. Okay, it's, it's just, just not lining up with the directions that I'm going. So I need to evaluate my desires. Do they line up? Are, are, if, if making money, if all of a sudden, you know what, I can take this job over here and I can make more money, but I recognize the job itself is not lining up with my values. It's going to take me away from those things that are an important part of who I am and what I need to be, what I need to recognize is, is that that desire is not something that I need to pursue. I, I, want, to, I want to see that ne- desire negated or adjusted because it's violating my values. Are you with me on this? So E is evaluate those desires that you may have. You know, uh, Scott's desire might be to be married to a 20-year woman, a 20-year old woman laying on a, on a beach somewhere in the Bahamas. He recognized that's illegitimate, right? He recognized that's not, that's not an appropriate desire. So if you've got these desires, if he's got these desires in your life, there's some that you've got to just identify them and just say, you know what? That desire, as I evaluate it, this desire is not appropriate. It needs to be canceled out. I, I, I don't want to add flames to this desire. I want to throw water on those flames. Right? Okay, S, and this is supplication. Now, these aren't necessarily in order. Okay, because all these things are going to be happening at the same time, and you can have your S before your D in this particular. I'm using this acronym just to give you some principles of dealing with your desires. S is supplication. Is supplication. That is when you go before the Lord. You want to bring your desires before God. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you something. When I go before God, I have a hard time praying for things that I want because I know that some things that I might think I want aren't really things that I really want. You know what I, anybody know what I'm talking about? That when I go to the Lord and I might be praying for something that I want, that instead of bringing the happiness in my life that I think it's going to bring me, God knows it won't bring me that happiness. Right? And so when I'm going to the Lord in supplication, I'm not just saying, God, fill these desires. This is what I really want. I really want this new car. I really want this, this or that in my life. I'm, at, I, I'm going, bringing them before the Lord, and I say, God, would you adjust my desires so that they are focused in the direction of those things that are really going to bring me the substance that I'm looking for? And this is so essential because there's a whole lot of people out there that, are, that, that think that these desires that they currently have are the ultimate to their satisfaction. And God knows that that's going to take you in a, a way that's not going to bring it to you. You know, it's like the person in a, outside of um, Nick and Trina. This is not directly uh, to you guys because you you're newlyweds. But one, one of the things that we... What a lot of people recognize, man, if only I can get married, I'll be happy forever. How many of you have ever been married or are married? Raise your hand. How many of you know that's not true? But at the time, you know, you've got these great desires. I mean, I'm not saying, marriage isn't bad, marriage is good, but that's not where happiness is found, right? That's, that's, that's a, something that you take happiness into. But I'll tell you, there's people that have these desires, oh, oh God, let this be the woman, let this be the man, oh God, let this happen. You know, what we need to pray is, God, is this who you want for me? I have these desires, but are my desires lining up with your desires? Are you with me on this? supplication, bringing it before the Lord. You know, what God's told us to do is, is that when we, when we delight ourselves in the Lord, He's going to give us the desires of our heart. 
He's not going to give us the desires of our mind. He's going to give us the desires of our heart. The desires of my mind might be, they're not, but I'm just using this illustration, might be a, a brand new car. That means the desire of my mind, this is what I'm thinking, this is what I want. I'm delighting myself in the Lord. God's going to give me the desires of my heart that's, that, that go beyond. I, I'm thinking what that car will bring me. God's saying, I'm going to give you something more because I'm going to skip the car and just give you what it would bring you. I think that car would bring me a sense of fulfillment and satisfaction. What God's saying is, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you something bitter when you delight yourself in me. I'm going to skip the car and give you that sense of satisfaction right now. And it won't even cost you a car to get it. Amen? God can do that, and God will do that. He'll give you the, if, when you delight yourself in the Lord, He'll give you the desires of your heart. But how do you learn to delight yourself in the Lord is, is that you need to surrender your desires to him. You need, to, you need to bring them before him. Many of the desires that you have, whatever they are, God has put within you. And those are definite things for you to pursue. They're definite things for you to pursue. He wouldn't have put them in there, but we need to bring them to him, constantly allowing him and his spirit to help us evaluate those in light of his will and purpose, right? Okay. So D, determination. Determine what your desires are and have a determination to accomplish them. E, evaluation. Are these, are these in accord with my values? Are these, are these desires appropriate? Are they, are they realistic to my current situations in life? And then S, supplication, bringing them before the Lord. And God's told us in Mark eleven twenty four, 24, he's told us this. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray... Believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. Anybody believe that? Okay, that's what the scripture tells us. And so, but the key is, is that I don't want the superficial desires. I want the substance of those superficial desires. Right? I don't want a good job. I want the best job that God has prepared me for. Right? I don't want to get married. I want to be married to the best spouse that I could ever be married to. That God wants me married to. Are you with me on this? I, I, the key is, is supplication. When you, you want to pray to God, he's going to give you the desires of your heart. But the key is you need to delight yourself in him so that you can identify and understand what those desires are. And then that takes us to I, which is identify. Whatever these desires are in your life, are they lining up with the prime directive? And this is, this is something that you need to establish. Is accomplishing this desire in my life lining up with my prime directive in life to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength and love my neighbor as myself? Is this desire in my life to help somebody else out? Is this desire in my life going to benefit anyone else but me? Is this desire in my life going to bring God glory? If I receive this desire in my life, will I be in a better position to promote the prime directive in my life? And so identify, and this, this helps you, this goes right along with evaluation. Is these, are these desires legitimate? Are they really legitimate for me? Are they really going to be beneficial? I really believe, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that it's the prime directive, when you are submissive to the prime directive, that you're going to find everything that you long for and desire. When your total focus is loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself, you're going to get way beyond what you could imagine in your own life. Okay? It comes by putting the Lord first. But identify. You know what? I want a new car. What's it going to do for the rest of my family? Absolutely nothing. The car I'm envisioning, they can't even fit in. Or, 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 (laughs) you know, you might say, I'm not... I'm not saying, but, or, or, or you might say, you know, and you're just identifying these things as to whether or not they are legitimate desires. Sometimes we're identifying the fact that this is a very expensive thing, and there's a whole lot of other things that are important in, in my life that supersede me spending a whole lot of money in this particular direction, right? And you, you do that through identification. You know, there's a difference between owning a, a Chevette to a, owning a Corvette, Right? I used to tell people when I used to deliver auto parts, yeah, I drive a vet. Oh, yeah, where is it? Yeah, Chevette's out there. 
But the, uh, you know, th- th- there's, a, there's, a, there's, a difference. there's a difference between the two. But the, the bottom line is identifying, identifying. Um, and then R is this, and this is, very impo- this is very important. When you recognize that this is not something that contradicts the will of God, uh, you've determined what that desire is, you've evaluated it, you've brought it before the God in prayer, it's still, even when you brought it to him, you said, God, take this away if it's not of you, and it's still intensely burning within your heart. It's still intensely burning. You identify that it's, it's not just a selfish prayer, but it's, it's going to be beneficial not only to you, but to others, and it's going to bring glory to God. Then it's, at that point, you need to recognize, you need to reinforce those desires. The, the fire that's burning, you need to add some flames too. You know, do you think it's a good thing? For example, let's just say I wanted to lose some weight. I wanted to lose weight. And one of the reasons I want to lose weight is uh, I want to be around here longer. And why do I want to be around here longer? Because I got some responsibilities I need to fulfill. And if I recognize that, you know, right now I'm being told, I'm, 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 again, I'm using this as an illustration, right now I'm being told that, you know, my weight condition or my situation is causing me a lot of health issues. And I recognize that it's, it's not only harming me, but it's harming others. And I, I, I know that God wants me to be healthy, and he wants me to be functional, and he wants me to do those things. So I, I, determine, I determine that one of my, my goals is to lose weight, let's just say. I evaluate that, and I, I recognize that there's a legitimacy. I, I recognize it's not going to be easy, but I can do this. This is something that can be accomplished in my life. I can, I can lose the ne- necessary weight. And so I bring it before the Lord. I say, God, do you want me to lose weight? Is this really you? Do you really, is this just me trying to look prettier? Or is this you trying to make me healthier and, and guiding me in a direction that's going to be best for me? And so I get to that point in my life where I recognize this is God, and he's confirmed it, and that desire is still strong in my life. Um, I've identified, as I said, it's not only going to benefit me, it's going to benefit some others. It's going to... Uh, um, certainly uh, allow me to uh, be around to, you know, maybe, be a, uh, maybe you're saying be a grandparent and, and to take care of my children, and these things I'm doing are detrimental to my health. Now I need to reinforce that. I need to reinforce that. It might be by putting something on my refrigerator to remind me, you know, I need to change my eating habits. And it, or to remind me of the importance of exercise or doing exercise things. What I... I your desire is not something that you're necessarily going to get immediately. It's something that you're going to progressively work toward, right? But to reinforce that desire in your life so that it doesn't go out. A lot of times, our desires, our desires get quenched because all of these things are getting thrown at us. All these situations and all of these scenarios. You have this great desire to lose weight, and you recognize the importance of it until Thanksgiving comes along. And so Thanksgiving comes along, and you oh, man, I might as well just, you know, it's Thanksgiving. The family's all here. I'm going to go out, and I'm going to eat, eat, some, eat some food. Next thing you know, Christmas comes along. Next thing you know, I, I, holiday after holiday come along, and you're making all kinds of excuses, and pretty soon, you're not even working toward it at all. You've lost, you've even lost the desire because you've lost your vision, right? Keep your vision. Keep it up. Add things, verbalize, read, write, verbalize it. Establish, establish those that are going to support you in that. So reinforce it. Reinforce those desires in your life. If someone hears, you know what, I feel called, to, Adriel tells me, I feel called to the ministry. You know, I, I, this is really what I want to do. What I want to do with his call to the ministry is I want, I want to be on his support team. I want to reinforce that in his life. You know, because all of a sudden it's going to be, man, I've got bills to pay, I've got to, I've got to do this, and pretty soon that call to the ministry gets, gets overrun by the affairs of life and by situations all around us. Anybody know what I'm talking about there? All of a sudden it's just, all, you know what, I'm, I'm not sure I can afford this, I'm not sure I can go in this direction, and all of a sudden he begins to lose that vision. But if he's surrounding himself with people and building up that desire, putting it before him, you know, uh, verbalizing, I'm called to minister for God, you know, and, and, and putting scriptures out there that's going to aid him and constantly reading those things and developing him, that will reinforce that desire. And then E, the last part of desire, is engagement, is engagement. That means get up and do something. Some people sit by a cold stove hoping to get warm instead of getting up and doing something. Amen? There's a whole lot of people that look at the pretty pictures and they'll say, boy, I wish I looked like him, and they're not doing anything about it. Right? 
engagement, putting into practice, taking steps, working toward that. These desires can be real in your life. I want you to know today, God wants to give you the desires of your heart. He does. But He wants you to evaluate the desires that you currently have so that you can truly understand that the desires He wants you to have are the ones that are going to bring you the best. What these things that go through our mind and we think we desire, they're really not going to bring us the best. It's just like the person, man, I, I wish I could feel high. I wish I could feel better. I'm feeling down. So someone comes along and says, you know what? I have something here for you. Here, smoke this crack cocaine. Here's some crack. It'll make you feel better. Okay? The person tries crack. It makes them feel better. They think, man, I, I, my desires have been fulfilled. Wrong. You're going the wrong direction. That's not the way that God wanted to fill your desires. It's superficial. It will leave you empty. Amen? It will leave you empty. Many of our desires along the same lines. Oh, God, please just give me a new job. Give me a, you know, give me a spouse or, or give me a new spouse. I don't know. Or, 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 you know, or, you know or, or this or that or the other thing. You know, the bottom line is this. The bottom line, listen. The bottom line is this. God wants to give you the desires of your heart, but you need to make sure your heart is where it needs to be. And that you're in a place where you're ready to receive what your true desires are. And then add fuel to those fires of the desires that God has placed in your heart. And then take, take daily steps. I shared with you before along goals is, you know, how do you eat an elephant? You know, one bite at a time. How do you achieve these goals in your life? Take one step. You're not going to, you, you know, if I want to lose weight, it's not, you know, let me see, I want to lose 50 pounds, let's say. I want to lose 50 pounds. I'm not going to do, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to come here next week 50 pounds lighter. Unless I chop off a leg or something. You know, that's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. But I recognize that I could take steps today that are going in that direction. Amen? So fulfilling that desire, and your desires can, will, how many of you know God wants to fill your desires, but all of these other steps go into hand, and one of those steps is work. Breaking it down into chunks. Doing what needs to be done today. Not losing that desire, keeping it before you. Um, when you have those obsessions in your life, and I've had them, and I'm here to testify today uh, of God's goodness. God has given me the desires of my heart. When I say that I'm living the dream, I'm being honest with you. I am living the dream. It's not my only dream, and I know that God will give me other dreams. But God has fulfilled the desires of my heart. I'm not going to go into all of them, but I will tell you this. It's true. He does. But the key is delighting yourself in Him. Delighting. Your desires, God wants to give you. He wants to give you. Quit doing it your own way. Quit trying to do things that are superficial because they will always leave you empty. Always. But if you will do it God's way, if you'll do it God's way, you will receive. You will receive. That is a promise. It's a promise from God, and so I can make that promise too. Because I am, I'm giving you God's promise to you. God wants to give you the desires of your heart but you need to learn to delight yourself in Him. The, your want to is an important part of what you're going to be able to can do. Okay, And so build up your want to. God wants to make you successful. He wants, he wants you to experience these blessings in your life. But the key is putting yourself in a position to receive that.